Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Channel Frederator, Manic Expression, The Comic Book Cast, and the Reopen Nickelodeon Studios in Orlando, Florida Facebook page. Welcome to a brand new episode of Casual Chats. I am Patricia and I'm here with a very special guest. For those who listen to the Metroid podcast, we have back from uh, Dom in the Chapel of Church, we have Lily. Welcome back, Lily. Hi. And of course, we have our good friend from Manic Expression, Jim. Welcome back, Jim. Screw the rules. I feel pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so today, um, in continuing with the Yu-Gi-Oh! You must pod- really hate dragons, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> How dare you summon fruit? <laughs> okay, so today we're actually going to be doing kind of like a continuation of the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise podcast that I did with the Cartoon Hero and the Media Hunter with the newest movie that just came out of the franchise. It's called Yu-Gi-Oh! The Dark Side of Dimensions. And right before we discuss about the movie, uh, similar to that other podcast, I'd like to know your guys' early history with the franchise. So, uh, Lily, why don't we start with you? I watched the very first uh, series, not Yu-Gi-Oh! Zero, but I watched the very first series back when I was something like six or seven, and I kept watching it until then. I always, uh, I sort of fell out of it with Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, but I got back into it recently with Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds, because that was surprisingly good, and uh, when I heard that there was going to be a new like Yu-Gi-Oh! movie in the same, you know, y- universe as the original that's basically continuing the original i decided i had to go see it and i saw it with my friend oh cool cool uh jim how about you kind of similar to lily i got into it when it started airing on kids wb back in was it either 2000 2001 yeah around that time i thought it was kind of interesting um you know, the Dual Island arc was quite amusing. Interesting twist on ter- the tournament anime trope. You should totally watch Fighting Foodons. It's the best anime ever made. No, none of that. Shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think things kind of... I kind of started to lose interest in it when it got into Battle City, because then it really just felt like they were dragging and trying their hardest to sell the cards. I actually disagree with that. I got like, way less into it during the Rise of the Dragons. Was that the one with the, the Orichalcos cult? Yeah, where they were, like, where basically they were trying to summon, like, these ancient dragons through the card game, yeah. and I was like, this is kind of stupid. I, I'm not really into this. Yeah. It, like, yeah. and then I kind of fell in love with, like, Hikaru no Go because it was sort of the same premise, yeah. just with a different game. See, I actually kind of like that art because I felt it ramped up the stakes a bit more. You know, and it actually did have some long-term consequences. So that was kind of a bit of a revival. Uh, the only thing that sounded it was for me was that they changed uh, they changed Mai's voice actress. So yeah. yeah. Then after that, like you, after I got into uh, uh, GX, I started losing interest too. Um, I did get interested in uh, in season zero, the one that was never dubbed. Uh, I'd heard. There are some fan dubs out there if you want to check them out, and they're pretty amusing, especially because they still try to go for the four kids style, and they keep Juni- they still give Jonucci the uh, the Brooklyn accent. <laughs> what, what I like about Yu Gi Oh Zero a lot was that in the abridged series, uh, how they did Yu Gi Oh Zero was they made Yami Yugi a total fucking sociopath, and it was just uh, fucking amazing. Yeah, yeah that, that was what helped it. That helped strengthen it as well. But I've read the manga, um, found it interesting. But like after GX, like you, I fell out. I didn't really fall, get into five Ds or anything. 
I and want five Ds personally. Card games on motorcycles. Card games on motorcycles. It was actually a fucking awesome like little premise, and the way it was done was really well, you know, documented. Yeah, but truth be told, I've been out of the fandom for a while, and uh, really the only reason that the main thing that got me to see the movie was hearing that Dan Green was back to voice Yugi. So when I heard that, I thought, okay, I have to see it now, and oh. I'm very glad I did. Oh God, uh, Dan Green. I, I, all I can think of when I, is his earlier roles, and I think Jim knows exactly what I'm talking about when I say earlier roles. Yes. <laughs> what I really liked about the movie was how it opened. Oh, oh, right before we get into the movie, I want to let our listeners know. There's going to be massive spoilers all over this. So oh, if oh you, fuck yeah. So if you have not seen the movie, which is going to be a less likely chance that you will because they're so slowly pulling out of the theater... So please wait for it on DVD, on demand, on whatever website that or, is going to be posted. You know, on. watch anime. it on Kiss Anime like a lot of people do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. But seriously, yeah. I highly recommend that you do watch the movie first and then come back to the podcast because who yeah, would we have a lot to say about it? So please, Lily, yeah, proceed. What I really liked about it was its its opening is so good because it's so ridiculous. Uh, yeah. It starts off with Kaiba in this, like, giant fucking space station, like, assembling the Millennium Puzzle. And you gotta wonder how a card game, uh, like, company got so big that they can have a fucking space station. No, no, no. No, Kaiba Corp is, the te- is a tech company. They don't make the card game. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, remember, uh, it's Pegasus that made the card games. Kaiba Corp. I, I guess Kaiba's dad probably wouldn't like seeing how his how his company's gone into yeah. kind of making tools for card games, but whatever. And um, then um, you know he's trying to assemble the Millennium Puzzle, I guess, to bring the Pharaoh back. Yeah, you see, here's an interesting thing, and I didn't find this out <coughs> until a little bit later. But the movie is going by the manga story in which. Kaiba didn't know that you that you know Yugi and the Pharaoh dueled with one another, and so that's why the Pharaoh went back into you know his um, time in the war. Um, you know he, he went back to his own time. So you see, in the manga, it was supposed to be like Kaiba was heading down towards the stairs for the ritual. He changed his mind and then he left. But in the anime, which I'm sure a lot of people have seen before reading the manga, Kaiba was there during the whole time. So I was kind of confused at first. Then when I found out it was taken from the manga's perspective, I was like, okay, th- that makes a little bit more sense. Actually, uh, yeah. actually it is taken from the anime's perspective, but Kaiba, um, Kaiba's really desperate to like actually yeah. beat the Pharaoh because he never did. Yeah. Right, he right. Never actually I mean, even though Pharaoh, multiple Pharaoh. times he kind of did, but it was always a bit unfinished. It's kind of a, um, kind of an interesting swerve for Kaiba, considering how in so much of the anime. Um, and even in some of the in one of the earlier movies, you know, Pyramid of Light, he was this, you know, such an ardent skeptic, refusing to accept magic. And now here he is, where he's turned it. He's turned the idea of mysticism and resurrection, and is obsessing over it now. It's kind of an interesting character swerve. Yeah, I um, mean, he, it's so interesting seeing that because throughout the entire series, we've seen Kaiba not believing in a Shizu, talking about that he was part of some reincarnation of the Pharaoh's assistant set and how the Blue-Eyes White Dragon was from his long-lost love. So it's funny seeing him kind of believing in it, but not for the purposes of, like, actually believing in the lore, but just wanting to re-duel the Pharaoh again. Yeah. Yeah. What I really like about it is Kaiba's kind of grown as a character in this movie, and is actually sort of kind of obsessed when you really look at it. Yeah. He's kind like of becoming he's, a bit more like Lex Luthor when you think about it. Yeah, he's not really a villain. He's more of a rival to where yeah. he just really wants to beat the Pharaoh on his own yeah. terms without underhanded tricks anymore. Right. He's like, he's 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 centered on his goals and that's... That's the driving thing. I mean, you even hear a talk in the, you even hear a mention later. He's willing to, if he could, rewrite reality just to, just to satisfy what his demands. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so so then we cut into Yugi and the gang and find out what they're up to. And they're in their last year of high school, and they're just hanging out with one another. And you can definitely see not only how much the characters have grown over the past couple of months where it, the story takes place, but I, I also have to admit that the voice acting in this movie is the best that I've ever heard from the four kids. Oh, type. yeah. Also, the animation's really good, and they didn't skimp out on any of the, like, Japanese stuff. Like, you know, you see them eating out of bento boxes and eating yeah. rice cakes and stuff like that. Yeah, um, and they didn't, and, you know, in the show, they would turn it into hamburgers and stuff like that. But, nope, they're making sure you know it's a rice bowl. Yeah, and my, uh... My favorite part, though, has to be when they walk in and they see fucking Diva sitting there. I forget his, like, fake name that he made up. Uh, I got, I, I got you. Yeah, I got me. Yeah, it, they're just like, who the fuck is that? And they're like, uh... And I'm just like, who the fuck is that? And they're like, oh, that's I got me. And I'm like, who the fuck is I got me? Yeah, they, they, pull a, they pull a Dawn from Buffy in this movie. Of course, Aigami is an overpowered piece of shit, but we'll get into that in a bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so one of, the, one of my favorite scenes in the movie is, you know, we're cutting back to Kaiba again. He's testing out the new dueling system. And, oh, man, I have to say that this was, like, one of my favorite moments in the movie. The way that the dueling system thing worked is so gorgeous. The animation, the colors, the way that the names and the stats are drawn out, it's amazing. It kind of makes you laugh looking back at GX and how they do the same system as the original. And then you're wondering, like, why couldn't GX look like this? It's amazing. And so you have Kaiba... Yeah, it's fucking awesome. It is. It's amazing. Oh, so yeah. you have Kaiba yeah, it... and the Pharaoh dueling with one another. And it's a, it's a great duel, even though it's, we know in the end it's not the real Pharaoh. But it's incredible. And we see, like, a whole bunch of new blue-eyes white dragons being summoned. We see the god cards being summoned. And then we cut into <laughs> when the when the hologram duel is over and... Kaiba is still not happy with it. Yeah, he, he's just not happy with it. Fucking, he drinks out of the water bottle, and, like, he crushes it and goes, fire whoever made this water bottle. <laughs> Kaiba should, should break this easy. Uh, or how about that he tried to min meticulously create the pharaoh even down to his coiffed hair? <laughs> his perfectly yeah. coiffed hair. His uh, perfectly coiffed hair. <laughs> You realize that this is gonna just reignite the Yuki Kaiba shippers all over again. Oh my god, I cannot... Okay, I actually have a story about this. So, when I was at the theater watching the movie, and I was surrounded by, surprisingly, a good, decent amount of people who liked watching Yu-Gi-Oh! And there was this girl right behind me, and she was talking about how much she was excited about this movie. She only heard about it a few days ago. And when they come to that scene of Kaiba and Yugi, she was squealing right behind me. It was so funny. <laughs> So, oh. uh, well, I uh, the theater, every time Kaiba was on screen, the theater erupted with laughter. Same, same. here. Yeah, same. Ka yeah, same. Kaiba and with Joey, every time they were on screen, they just got the most, they just got the most fan response. Yeah. I, I, oh, oh, man, I, I have, so, I have so many stories about that. This is probably one of the most fun experiences I've had in a movie theater in a while. I yeah, haven't had yeah, this I much agree. experience with this kind of thing since I saw the Avengers. And I, I was a little disappointed with uh, whenever, like, the guy who used to own, like, a card shop who was trying to make Dungeon Dice Monsters. I can't remember his oh, exact name. Duke? Yeah, Duke Devlin. Uh, I was a little disappointed that they didn't have, uh, I'm bringing sexy back in the background every time he was on screen. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I can't expect that. I, I've been clouded by the fucking abridged series. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't blame you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sure somebody out there would have was probably disappointed that Kaiba didn't say screw the rules or something. I kept expecting Bakura to, like, call the uh, Millennium Ring his gaydar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking of Bakura, yeah. you know, in this movie, he's surrounded by a whole bunch of girls who are just so infatuated with his accent. Yeah, yeah, and it's so strict. It, it's so fucking great. Yeah, they they can't resist the power of the bishy. <laughs> yeah. So continuing on, so we have this new character Aigami, and he's a bit mysterious, but we soon <coughs> get to learn that he's part of this group of people who are 
doing this uh, who has you know who are the who has the power of the plana and it's supposed to be like some sort of power that can be able to change the world into a quote unquote better place if they got rid of evil and they learned it from their master shin and so what they're trying to do is that they're preventing Kaiba from putting together the Millennium Puzzle because if the Pharaoh re- resurrects again, then the power of the Plana would disappear. Oh, yeah, but the problem is that the power of the Plana has kind of been tainted. Right, because um, Aigami is full of hatred and he's full yeah. of fear. And Mr. Master Shin taught them about that they shouldn't be filled with that because they need to have their minds clear so they can be able to achieve their goal. Yeah, so... And that's what I kind of like about I liked about um, Aigami slash Diva. He was a, you know, he was a villain. He was an antagonist with, with legitimate motivations. You know, there was a bit of revenge driving him, and also a uh, desire to basically make the world a better place as he saw it. But he was fully committed to you know, not, nothing short of nothing nothing short of murder to get it. He really believed that the ends justify the means. He did some bad shit to some people. Oh yeah. Yeah, like, the, the, of course, there's the one scene in which he gathers up a whole bunch of bullies and saying that he was going to meet them over at this abandoned um, building. And so he basically just opens up his cube, which kind of reminds me of the cube from... Um, um, Hellraiser? Hellraiser, thank you. So he, he takes this cube that looks like something from Hellraiser and opens it up, and when you see the pain that the bullies go through, it is it looks so painful. I mean, if it was yeah. like in the original four kids, you know, dub, it would have never shown the excruciating amount of pain, like the veins and so the eyes. Pain, yeah. I mean, oh, it was yeah, that so, freaks me out. I was I was legitimately uh, like shocked um, with it. And then when you find out what the dimension they're being summoned to actually looks like, it just kind of makes it worse. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's fucked up. It's it's worse than death. So, um, yeah, continuing on. So we, <laughs> so we have Yugi and the gang at the mall, and they see Aigami. Well, they don't see Aigami. They see Kaiba announcing about the new dual disc, and... Joey gets completely jealous. Uh, he's even dressed up in the um, the dog suit, similar to when he first met Duke, which is kind of like yeah, a nice touch. That, why exactly did, was he in that dog suit again? I feel there was something that uh, was like, cut from the script. He, he no, uh, he was working for like the ice cream sales. Uh, oh yeah. Oh right. All right. I've, right. Okay. That. But why would they make him wear the suit again? I mean, I I, I think it was just supposed to attract kids. Oh, okay, I see your point there. I, I forget. It's Japan. They yeah, have bigger... They're more into know, animal and, mascots. Right, and I, I believe that also he was starting to save up money so he can buy the dual disc, which is why he wanted to keep his job. Uh, and, and oh my God, uh, Joey like has aspirations to be like a professional dueler, which, if you see in the show, is a bit sad. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because in GX, he's never referenced again. And it's kind of sad, too, about when Tristan mentions about what he was going to do after he graduated, that he was going to work in his father's factory. And then, you know, it's an also nice touch that Taya talked about that she was going to be moving to New York to become a dancer. Yeah, that was a nice touch. It's It really is kind of sad, though, that Tristan wanted to be a professional duelist. And it's not just because he's never mentioned again. It's also because just, like, he was honestly never that good. Well, yeah, and I guess one of the disappointing things about this movie is that we never got to see Joey duel. I think that was like one of the uh, complaints that I did hear from some people. Yeah, I guess for a two-hour movie, you can't really have that much in it. You have to condense some things, but I mean, they could have at least shown it like an intro like they did with oh, Pure oh, Fight. Oh, speaking of, uh, this movie was pretty long, to be honest. Yeah, like, I mean, unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of anime movies are becoming this long nowadays. Like, I heard the same thing about One Piece Gold and Sailor Moon R, the movie, being this long as well. Uh, I actually, like, looked up how long uh, Evangelion Rebuild was, and uh, this movie actually, like, tops it by about 30 minutes. Wow. When, you, when you're longer than an Evangelion movie, that is, that's an accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really liked it. It was really good. I never felt bored, and I was never, like, checking the time to make to see, like, oh, when's it gonna fucking end? Like, I was just, you know, into it the whole time, and honestly, when it was over, I was a little bit, like, excited to see if they make 
another one? Yeah, a new movie. Yeah. Be fun. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that later. So, um, so yeah, we have, um, so we have uh, Joey kind of disappointed that he can't save up the money so he can get himself a new dueling disc. And then um, later on, we do cut into Aigami keeping an eye on Yugi so that, you know, he doesn't try to resurrect the Pharaoh. And then we do get to see Kaiba in and out. They found the Millennium Puzzle over at the tomb, and they they also go to the, um, the same room where Yugi and the Pharaoh dueled in the last few episodes of the anime, which was actually really nice. They were able to find the pieces, and then Aigami shows up, ready to duel Kaiba. This is where the dueling begins, and I don't know about you guys, but the introduction of the Dimension Duels, I didn't really like it. No. I didn't either. I... There was another part of it that I really hated, and I'm going to get into that like in immense detail because I actually played the card game. Yeah, what really confused me was that how Kaiba seemed to know Diva, and that really confused me. But then I did a little digging and I saw that there was actually a, a prequel manga that was about. Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, there was supposed to be a prequel manga that came out during the um, the time when the movie was coming out in Japan. Yeah. yeah. And that kind of, and that was kind of like how Kaiba was introduced to Diva and and Sarah. So, you know, this is a problem I have not only with anime but with like video games and other stuff. You need to keep all the story relevant material contained in the story you want to tell. If you put it in, you know, extraneous material like tie-in books or short films or comics, then you know, not everyone's going to see it, and they're going yeah. to get they're going to be lost. Yeah. Uh- now, on to, like, their little duel, um, and this one, you guys know my complaint with this one. I fucking hate cubic monsters. They're awful. I've been out of the game for a while, so... Yeah, uh, me really... too. I mean, I do know that there was, like, a huge change of the rules ever since they went over to 5Ds with, like, the synchro summons and whatever. <coughs> At least that's what Meteor Hunter told me when we were doing the Yu-Gi-Oh! podcast, yeah. so I'm kind of confused about the new rules. Uh, I can explain why the cubic monsters, like the cubic baby seed things, don't work, and why I hate them, like, Please. really accurately. I would love to know. Um, okay, the cubic baby things, if you don't know what they do, is if you fucking kill them, they make it so your monster won't be able to attack, and they come back. And that is such a dicky, like, cop-out fucking thing to have, and that's way overpowered. Because, like, Matt LJ, yeah, Matt LJ is fucking overpowered. Like, you fucking summon a couple creatures, and then you're able to summon the Matt LJ Queen, and then you'll end the game. But, like, Cubic is worse. Just because it's, like, fucking taunting you with turns. Yeah, I can't deny, I mean, based on what they show, those Cubic monsters do look really overpowered. Oh, yeah. So I, I mean, the, if you are able to pull it off right, there is absolutely no way you can attack them. Yeah. Yeah, and it's fucking annoying. It's irritating. I will say, though, that the monsters, their design at least, it was pretty impressive. I mean, the Cubic monsters look like something you'd encounter in, like, a Shin Megami Tensei game. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. They do look like uh, SMT monsters. Um and what I really like was, of course, this duel also had my favorite scene ever, where Kaiba sob- summons Obelisk the fucking Tormentor and says, It's not a monster, it's a god. When that scene happened, everybody was applauding. Although, I have to say, where did Obelisk the Tormentor come from? Because, I mean, the god cards um, went alongside with the Millennium Items. I-, I think in the anime, he made a copy of Obelisk the Tormentor specifically. Oh, okay. Or it could have just been that, or I figured it could have just been a manifestation of his will. Yeah, it could have been. That's, that is true. I mean, even though that we do know that Kaiba yeah. doesn't really 100% believe in the heart of the cards, but it could have been a manifestation of his will. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it could have. Um, him summoning the actual obelisk from, like, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, like a, a mimic card? Yeah. Would definitely be manifestation of will. Sure. Yeah. Because technically those Mimic cards aren't supposed to be able to have the power to actually summon the Egyptian gods, but, like, I guess if you have enough willpower... Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Close. Yeah. Okay, so I can accept that. So, the okay, so the duel kind of ends abruptly when the security system for the Millennium Pieces is over, and then Mokuba comes by, sh- shuts down the, um, the block, and rises up via the helicopter, and then Aigami grabs two pieces without Kaiba knowing. 
And then we cut back into Yugi and the gang, and, um, you know, they start, um, they start noticing that something is wrong. You know, they start notice, uh, you know, with Aigami meeting up with Joey and with Bakura, and we get to know a little bit of an inside story into more of Aigami, and we do learn that Master Shin is actually shoddy. And that then, was something that struck me as, well, as odd, too, the retcon for shoddy's uh, origin. I mean, it fits, but it just, I don't know, part of it just seemed to come out of nowhere. Yeah, uh, then again, I think it was always the case in which shoddy was a spirit, when, you know, even when he met up with Yugi, I think. Actually, when you think about it, if Shadi died to Bakura back then, it would actually make sense for him to be a spirit when he meets Yugi. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking as well, because, you know, Shadi just seemed to have appeared out of nowhere when he first met up with Yugi over in um, Yugi's mind. He, I mean, not, not uh, mind, right? He's the spirit of the Millennium Items, basically. Right, and he was mm-hmm. protecting the Millennium Items, just like we saw in the flashback when Bakura's father came by and he wanted to get a hold of the Millennium Ring, and then it overtook him, and so then it, and then Bakura lashed onto it, and then he turned into his dark form that we would know throughout the series, and so zombie Bakura, zombie Bakura, and so then we see Aigami kind of turn his eye towards. Bakura saying like he was the one who killed Shadi and then he made him disappear and then he made Joey disappear and then we get to see what happens when a person disappears and it's like and their memories it's... slowly go away until they reduce to nothing yeah. it's pretty fucking scary especially it's even scary when you consider that um it's mentioned early in the in the in the movie that this has been happening all over the world and it happened to those to that group of bullies who were going after Igami and and you know, they actually never, never they actually never say if the bullies were okay afterwards. Yeah, you never see them come back. So it's pretty <laughs> yeah, clear so, it's pretty clear yeah. that a lot of people were straight up murdered in this movie. <laughs> yeah, like, they never come back. You never yeah. see them come back. <laughs> it's fucking <Yeah>. weird. <laughs> I know. People were murdered in a Yu Gi Oh movie. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, even then, I mean, even before, uh, like, you know, going back to when Aigami was about to approach the Millennium Puzzle pieces, one of Kaiba's henchmen pulled out a gun. Yeah. Something you would never see in the Four Kids show. Yeah, exactly. They would probably just do some stupid excuse or something, like the invisible guns crap. Yeah. I'm pointing at you. Wait a second, now that you think about it, Kaiba's kind of a badass. He got shot at and jumped out the window. Uh, in the, like, in the original series he did, because in the 4Kids dub, yeah, they shot out the invisible guns, but in the original, they were, like, shooting at him. Oh, that's right, wow. yeah, now I remember. Yeah. Man, that was a long time ago that I saw that. It was months ago when I was preparing for and the Yu-Gi-Oh! podcast. Up for, and that, you know, set up for the first duel where he wins against the Pharaoh, technically wins. He only really wins because he threatened to kill himself. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, continuing on, so um, so when Yugi is packing up his cards, um, you know, and the shop is closed, we get to see Sarah, and she just appears out of nowhere, and it's all creepy. Every time she showed up, I had the urge to shout out, Sarah, like Snow from Final Fantasy XIII. Yeah, uh, every time she every time she showed up, I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, where did she come from? <laughs> like, it, she's like the fucking ring girl, she's just fucking creepy. Yeah, yeah she is. Yeah, and and uh, I missed this uh, particular scene uh, when I was talking about the the movie, but I really one of the things that I really loved about you know seeing Yugi as a character in this movie was when he was talking about how much he missed the Pharaoh. I'm sure if any of you guys know in the Japanese version, the Pharaoh and Yugi didn't call each other by their names; they called each other by you know Atsume Oboku, which is the other me, and Aibo, which is partner. So, in a literal yeah. sense. Yugi, when he was saying about a part of me is gone, like literally a part of him was gone. So it's not yeah, just like I, I really miss him as a when friend. He started, and I really liked when he called the Pharaoh a ten. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That had a lot of symbolic meaning. No, exactly. I mean, even the others call him a ten. So yeah, I mean, it's just it's just so amazing to see Yugi, even though that he still misses the Pharaoh, he's still his own person, and he's trying to figure himself out. He's, tr- he's trying to figure out how to be his own, you know, like his own duelist because yeah. the attempt was him. 
Yeah, pretty yeah. much. And even think, um, the cartoon hero told uh, told this part when we were doing the Yu Gi Oh podcast when when GX came along and we do get to see Yu Gi all grown up meeting up with Judai. He talked about how, in a way, he did become you know similar to the Pharaoh in which he grew up. He understood who he was and he was able to become a strong duelist in his own right. I, I have to say, my my favorite interactions in this movie have have to be between. You know, the gang. You know, they're just they're good interactions. You learn a lot about them. Yeah, the, it, it is very oh, yeah. good. I think uh, I have another scene that I really do like. But I'll get to that in a minute. So, okay, so Sarah comes along and talks to Yugi that she has a piece of the Millennium Puzzle and that she wants it to keep it safe so that the Pharaoh will never come back. And so we have. Um, I got me captured by Kaiba Corp inside this container, and then, um, you know, because Kaiba knew, like, a few hours in when the thing, when this, you know, contraption was putting together the pieces, he, it was saying, like, you know, um, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, I can't put together the, um, the Millennium Puzzle, it's like, impossible, you were created to do so, why can't you? He's like, well, there's a few pieces missing, and then Kaiba figures it out immediately. In fact, they were really quick to figure out that even Yugi had the remaining piece. I also love that bit with the uh, with the computer, where uh, it's explaining how I know everything they, that happens in Domino. No, no, where where the computer's assembling the puzzle and it talks about all the steps it's going through and how long it will take, and Kaiba is annoyed why. He, because, you know, he's the one who built it, and, and the computer says, My apologies, but I was programmed to know you like being reminded of your own genius. <laughs> so I thought that was a nice little bit of... I thought that was a nice comedic bit there. Yeah, it's just awesome. It's self-aware, which I love about it. Yeah. Okay, so finally, uh, when Kaiba finds out that Yugi has the other piece, um, he kind of tells Yugi to challenge him in a duel, and the winner of the duel has to give Kaiba the pieces so he can be able to put it together for the Pharaoh, so he can duel him again. And the the interaction with Kaiba and Yugi is so incredible. He stands up to Kaiba, not taking his crap, and he's saying he wants him and Aigami to duel. And and that is just awesome, I have to say. It's so great. And, and, to- and Kaiba just goes, okay. Yeah, exactly. He, he's just like, okay. He could have just easily talked Yugi out of it, but no, he was perfectly okay with it. And so we see Yugi and Naigami duel, and it's pretty awesome, but him dueling, uh, Yugi dueling with Kaiba was so awesome. When he summons the Apple and Lemon Magician Girls, and then Kaiba was shocked by it, it's like, how could you summon me fruit? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Kai was the fucking best in this fucking movie, and yes. of course we hear we are well. You're my personal favorite line. I don't know why it's my favorite. Wow, you really hate dragons, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh, you were tweeting me of a storm with that line. <laughs> yeah, like I just fucking. It. I don't know why, but that line just stuck with me. Like, it, I just gave a little hearty chuckle. Yeah. In the it was good. Yeah, I liked it too. I just And I just love the deadpan delivery. Uh, speaking of deadpan bl- delivery, I remember when Aigami was kind of trying to befriend the other, um, you know, when, with Yugi and the gang, and he was seeing everybody interact with another, and Aigami was just like clapping. He's like, yay, fun. It's like, wow, this is like the most deadpan, not even giving a crap ever. Yeah, it's so great. Anyway, so what? the duel with Yugi and Kaiba, I have to say, I mean, even though it was kind of incomplete because, you know, Aigami was pretty much overtaken by the Millennium Ring, which, you know, as a lot of people know from the anime, Zork Necrophades <laughs> is the one that resides in it, starts taking over him, and he just looks so creepy. Uh, wasn't Zork excised from the ring, though? I, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess if it's taken from the manga, maybe he was in the ring? I have no idea. But I do know that Zork Necrophage was in the Millennium Ring, but, yeah. I mean, it's definitely not Bakura, because, you know, that part of him is long gone. But the, the, the grotesque yeah. look of Zork mixed with Aigami was just so creepy-looking. I mean, it, in a sense, I almost kind of wanted to laugh at it, because the face... 
it just looks so hilarious. Yeah, it looks just fucking creepy. It, it's <laughs> like just great. It's like this weird hybrid. You know, you have the you have the gargoyle like body. And you have the weird uh, cubic protrusion sticking out from the eyes. Yeah, it was really it was really unsettling. Yeah, and the voice, the voice. Oh God, the fucking voice. Oh yeah. And, and another thing is that you have Yugi and Kaiba dueling together, like legitimately together, to face off against this Zork manifested Aigami. And it's so cool looking seeing the Dark Magician with blue eyes Neo Dragon. Pretty epic scene. And I have to admit, I didn't really think the duels were the strongest part of this movie. I don't know. For some reason, they just weren't doing it for me. But that was a really incredible moment also the way the millennium cube just started corrupting the world was just fucking oh god yeah and then when we have the moment that everybody's been waiting for throughout this entire the the theater that i was at when yugi decides to put the millennium puzzle together with the last two pieces the pharaoh doesn't come back and he even says that he wants to see the Pharaoh come back just as much as Kaiba, but he knows he's never coming back. And, yeah, I mean, it's true. When I first saw this movie, I was like, yeah, how is the Pharaoh going to come back? Everybody knows that the Pharaoh spirit left alongside with the Millennium Items. So I- I'm glad that they were able to bring that up a bit. Yeah, and what I really did like that by the Pharaoh's own kind of sheer will, because, you know, Yugi was in trouble... He did come back. Yeah. And they didn't have to say anything. They just acknowledged each other, and then that was it. I mean, that's all you needed. Yeah, it was It was simple. It was subtle. It was, you know, it was, it was perfectly handled, I think. Yeah. And then, oh my god, we gotta get to the ending soon. Oh, oh you know what? I mean, yeah, we, we gotta get to the ending soon. So... Okay, so the power of the Plana is gone because the Pharaoh was resurrected, and so life becomes back to normal. Life is back to normal with everybody who has been involved in it, and we see except for all the people who got killed earlier on. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I mean all those minor people who got killed, and we'll just move on. So we have the gang saying goodbye to Taya as she leaves for New York, and Lily, please tell everybody about the last step, um, the last scene of the movie. Okay. So Kaiba decides, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build a fucking dimension traveling uh, system. And so he does in the space station. And then we see him get into it and Mokuba going, no, we don't know if this is going to work or not. And then he's just like, screw you, I have money. And then he fucking like starts the system and it just drops down the elevator at like the speed of light. And then... We see him land in, like, the desert, and he gets out, and he approaches the, like, temple, and he sees a ten. It's fucking great. Yeah, and yeah. then the movie ends with everybody saying, "Oh!" but they were clapping in the end, so that was actually pretty cool. Yeah, it was fucking awesome. Uh, I can't wait to see how they resolve that, and I can't wait to see if Kaiba can actually fucking get back. Well, he has to get back, otherwise how is he going to start Duel Academy in GX? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so overall, what did you guys think of this movie? I fucking loved it. It was so great. It was everything I love about Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, same. I mean, it was, it could be over the top and melodramatic at times, but, you know, you come to expect that, but... There was some genuine heart in it, too. You know, especially in the scenes with Yugi and, um, uh, you know, talking about how much he would love to see the Pharaoh return, but finally acknowledging that he has to move on, as everyone does. And I just love how they took the opportunity also to fill in some gaps, like explain exactly how Bakura got the ring, because that was something that I always wanted to learn, to be honest. And even the shoddy retcon, uh, you know, making him magic dimension hopping Jesus who was friend to all children it was you know a little off putting at first but then no, I, really, I think it fits okay okay so um, have you guys seen the other two movies because I haven't outside of the abridged versions uh, no I, I never saw Bond I, Beyond Time 
I never saw Pyramid of Light or that uh, or the uh, GX Five Ds crossover. Um, Pyramid of Light is perfectly skippable. Let's just say that. Okay. Uh, I just I, I only watched them in the abridged versions. So yeah, overall. In a few hours, the sun will rise. <laughs> Yeah. So overall, I have to say that if you are a Yu-Gi-Oh fan, definitely watch this movie. So yeah, um, I guess uh, if you have any final words to say, then I think we can wrap things up. I guess I can just talk about why I like Yu-Gi-Oh a little bit. Sure, um, go ahead. I've always, lo- I've always liked anime where they kind of make this like minor part of the world into the biggest thing ever. Like, um... I don't know if anyone here's seen like Hikaru no Go, but they did that in Hikaru no Go as well, where everything was settled with a game of Go, and everyone in the world played Go for whatever reason, even though that's like not true in this world at all. Like it was still interesting, and I I, I love Yu Gi Oh because it exacerbates that and makes it even like huger. I guess is the best way to put it. Sure. And, and, and when watching this movie, did it remind you of that? Yeah, it did actually. Uh, it did remind me a lot of that, and I, I also really liked how um, when Yugi asked how Kaiba knew he had part of the Millennium Puzzle, Kaiba just said, "I know everything that happens in Domino," which he does because he's got a huge spy network <laughs> set up around the entire city. He's basically fucking Big Brother, yeah. Yeah, like I said, he he really is coming becoming more and more like oh. a little, more like Lex Luthor, I'd say, but you know he's not so far gone. Oh, are we ever going to talk about uh, Kaiba's creepy image of his brother? Oh, you mean the way Mokuba looked? I mean, I thought that the suit and tie kind of thing... I thought no, that... no, 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 no. Uh, I mean, like, in the original series, in the virtual reality game, Mokuba was a prince. Oh, yes! <laughs> that he had to serve. And that was so fucking weird! <laughs> That was kind of weird, I have to admit. I tried to, fr- I tried to block that out of my head, to be honest. <laughs> but seriously. I like, how, I, I like how they did it in uh, fucking the Abridged series. Uh, fucking um, how Mokuba gets kidnapped as the princesses. Uh, not because he told her, like, I want to dress as you so you don't get kidnapped. He just said, I want to be pretty, too. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to be pretty. <laughs> yeah, it's so great. No, but seriously, Santa, I mean... Why, Santa, why am I a girl in your imagination? Shut up, oh God. <laughs> oh, geez. We're going we're gonna to have to give Martin some residuals for all the lines with his recording. Oh, yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll definitely put a few cents in his PayPal account. Anyway... <laughs> Um, I think we can wrap things up. So, if like I, like I said before, if you haven't seen this movie in theaters, then I highly recommend that you do check it out, whether it comes out on DVD or uh, it, online. Even or, though we spoiled it, you have to see it. It's, yes. like, really good. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Even though we spoiled this entire movie for you, seriously, you have to see it for yourself. It is that good. Yes. If you're if you're a longtime fan or if you've been out for a while, like I have, it is still worth seeing. It will rekindle your love for the franchise. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, I have to say thank you so much for joining. I had a really fun time. Uh, same here. Um, I'm probably going to um, do some improv. I've been thinking about making YouTube content for a little while. Uh, my friend invited me out to improv at about 4.30. Ooh. Oh, great. Uh, uh, definitely. Next time that you come over to the podcast, please, we would love to know about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Hey. Uh, Jim, have you got anything coming up? Uh, chapter 5 of Power Rangers Helios is going to be coming up in the next week. And I'm also thinking about doing a little side series um, where I'm going to be counting down the 10 best one-hit wonders from the 70s to the 2000s. And my... In my YouTube stuff, I might do a review of Uplink and Hacknet. Awesome. Oh, cool. Awesome. I, I, I've been obsessed with those games lately. I've been playing them, like, nonstop for the past, I don't know, uh, three days. Can't wait to hear Can't wait to see it. 
Anyway, yeah. so for um, anyway, in the comments below, please let us know if you were able to see the movie, and let us know your thoughts about it, your pros, your cons, your favorite one-liners, all that good stuff. And uh, if you didn't see the movie and you actually listened through this whole podcast, then I'm sorry, but hopefully you'll be able to be interested in seeing it. And uh, yeah, that should be it for this episode of Casual Chats. Hope to see you around soon, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.